Good morning. Good morning. How's everyone? Great. My name is Janine Uzel, and I am now your host for this panel. And um, so we're going to get into a few topics, and uh, I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves. Thank you all for, you can bring me down a little, for being here. Um, so my name is Janine Uzel. I am the former head of Women in Technology for General Electric, mechanical engineer, MBA. Um, and most of my work has been in the emerging market, so introducing technologies that have worked in the emerging market. What I also um, will be sharing about on tomorrow will be the bias in code and the importance of diversity and inclusion as we're coding and program, particularly in the voice AI platform. This particular panel is going to talk more about securities and ethics, so I think you'll have, um, I know for a fact you'll have a great experience in, in listening and learning to, with some of the information we have here. So like facial recognition, voice has the potential to facilitate global success. This session will address keeping on the positive side of the double-edged sword, exploring the issues of protecting uh, neural networks from invasion and pitfalls to avoid while bridging the divide of dialect, tone, and gender to keep bias from becoming a barrier to success. So my conclusion with my brief introduction before I allow the panel, and we'll start on the end and work our way this way, is that um, the critical gap in the ethics of code certainly is seen in the lack of diversity. Technology is obviously subject to the software, which is subject to the design. And so what we can often experience is that the end user receives the bias or the prejudice or the ignorance or the arrogance of the person that is actually coding it. And there are lots of examples, if you come to my talk tomorrow, I'll tell you about it, um, that we have seen and many of you may have experienced and been the end user of. So then the question becomes, what is our responsibility if you are a leader in coding, if you are a coder yourself, if you're running a team, if you have a product that's out there, to make sure that you're designing for the total user and not separating or leaving out um, what the future looks like. So AI is happening. Uh, the question simply becomes, will we ensure that integrity um, is, is facilitated in this process and that every user has the best experience and also that the technology and the products that we are working on have a chance to be usable, scalable, and profitable. And diversity and inclusion in technology is going to be critical to that. So that's my introduction. I'm going to start on the end here. All right, well, first of all, I wanna echo and say thank you all so much for coming out. My name is Jeff Nelson, and I primarily wear two hats. Um, first, I am the founder and CEO of an early stage startup called Sinchappi. At Sinchappi, we're using machine learning to help uh, businesses explore, analyze, and automate data without writing code. Um, and you can just imagine a lot of the security and ethical implications uh, that exist in the work we do there. In addition to that, I am uh, one of the co-founders and CTO of a company called Blavity, which is a digital media company uh, that has five different brands that creates content for and, by, uh, for and by urban millennials. Um, at Blavity, we're doing some interesting things uh, very early stage with, with machine learning. Um, I want to talk a little bit about that uh, because I think it's really interesting um, and relevant to this panel. So uh, Blavity's business model, like so many media companies, is one that's driven primarily by putting content in front of an audience. And that content can be videos, it can be written blog posts, um, it could also be advertisements. Uh, the optimistic uh, version of me likes to think of ads as merely content, right? But it's how we monetize the business. And uh, how many people in here like ads? How many people like going to uh, YouTube or, or, or watching TV or anything and seeing ads, right? Very few people. We, we've got quite a few. But thank you. Um, I don't like ads either. I, I always have to remember to turn my ad block off whenever I go to one of our websites, right? Ads are annoying. And so what the industry, what digital media uh, companies have to do is we have to figure out how to encourage our users to voluntarily engage with us on a very deep level. And Blavity has been, is pretty unique among digital media startups in that we're characterized by having a very loyal audience. Um, and that exists for a number of reasons, but uh, evidence of that is in 
the number of active recurring users that we have on a monthly basis. Newsletter uh, open rates are much higher than industry standards. So our user base is fairly engaged. Um, I, I, I'd venture to say uh, really engaged. And that comes be, that, that exists because early on, our business model was built by having um, experience transcend both in person and digital. And so that's where we are today. So how does machine learning fit into this and where are we trying to go? Well, we want to get out of being a primarily ad-supported business, right? We want subscription models. We want other revenue models that exist because our users find great value and are, are essentially volunteering to engage more deeply with us. And so part of that means we have to be able to give them a curated experience. When they come to BlabBee, it has to feel like it's personalized, uh, like it's individualized. And in order to do that, that's where the machine learning comes into play. And that's where we're understanding our users across all of our different sites. Uh, that's where we're able to predict what they want to see. That's where we're able to go with partners and tell them that, hey, this, camp this ad campaign, that, you that this, this sort of um, custom ad campaign that you want to do is going to work for this segment of our audience. And we know it. We know our, our audience very well. And all of that is ripe with potential pitfalls with respect to uh, data security, but also just ethics, right? Um, the biggest example of this is, um, the, the exa is, is Facebook and how their platform was being used by some partners for uh, what many would say uh, are nefarious purposes. And so now we've shifted from an environment where um, users are volunteering data online and not thinking twice about it to one where now they're seeing the consequences of that. And so now everyone is saying, well, what are you doing with my data? And so we've gone from it's so easy to get data on users and train machine learning models and do these things to now, because of GDPR and other regulations, you really have to be very intentional about making sure you have user consent, which is absolutely appropriate. Uh, but it does add an additional challenge when you're trying to build out these platforms. And so that's some of the work that we do there. And I, I do look forward to some of the questions and getting into some of the details about uh, what, what, are the, what, what are the challenges from a security and ethics standpoint that we've run into. Uh, very quickly, before I turn the mic over, at Sinchappi, similar things. We're trying to use machine learning uh, to, to take arbitrary data sets and help people make use of that. And you get into a lot of issues of bias uh, in particular, when you're dealing with B2B companies that themselves don't have a lot of diverse representation. And so the inputs to the models, we've got to be able to correct for that um, to, to eliminate some of that bias. Um, so there are some interesting challenges as well. So that's what I do. I look forward to, to you know, diving into some questions in a bit. Thanks. Uh, hi. So my name's Nicholas. Uh, I just graduated with a PhD in computer science from Berkeley and have now started at Google Brain. Uh, I do research in computer security and machine learning. So I look at questions of the kind, uh, what happens when we deploy these systems in the real world? There are adversaries out there. What will they be able to do? So the most recent line of work that we've been pushing on is showing that the currently used deep learning methods that everyone is using today are especially vulnerable to sorts of attacks. And so it, sort of the way that I'm going to be mainly talking about that here is that it turns out that uh, digital assistants are, it is possible to construct audio that to all of us sounds like maybe music or like someone else talking or a random noise, but to all of your devices will sound like specific commands like, okay, Google, please browse this web, web page. Okay, Alexa, buy this thing. And we can sort of control these devices without people actually being aware of what it is that's actually going on. Um, and so I, I tend to think about sort of the problems in this space. I do a little bit less on the ethics side. Uh, but I'll be happy to sort of talk about the state of the research. Um, I'm, I've sort of kept up with the research community on ethics, and there's been a whole bunch of recent work there that I think is very interesting, showing a lot of biases in the models that sort of are very difficult to correct for. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, thank you for coming. So my name is Nan Tran, and I'm the head of natural language analytics at Fractal Industry. So um, my background is in mathematics, but now my focus is on machine learning, deep learning, and uh, cybersecurity. Uh, so I work on a um, couple of problems in cybersecurity my, together with my team. So we build an advanced cyber decision platform to help corporates um, like protect their employees, their infrastructure, and uh, their properties. So uh, we try to apply machine learning, uh, deep learning, or AI in general to every aspect of cybersecurity. And uh, yeah, we, we see that AI has the great potential to change the landscape of cybersecurity. Uh, in short, it is the future of 
um, cybersecurity. So I'm going to start right back with you, Nan. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, some of the timeline of AI development and your knowledge and information around its achievements and failures, safety and security? Just kind of give us a, a general overview. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. So before we talk about security and uh, ethics in uh, machine learning, yeah, I think it's a great idea to talk about the timeline of AI success and failures. So um, in 2004, uh, DAPA sponsored uh, autonomous driving, I mean, a car, right? Uh, grand challenge, and the, the technology from that challenge later helped Google to build uh, self-driving cars. In uh, 2005, Honda Asimo robot can work as fast as human, and I mean now we use the same technology in military. Right? In 2007, um, I mean computers learn how to play a perfect game of checkers by like searching a vast amount of information in the database. Uh, in 2011, everyone knows that IBM wasn't destroy human in a TV show. Right? And in 2012, uh, Google introduced Google Knowledge Graph. It's the first step to true insurance. In 2013, Facebook released uh, Graph Search. So it reveals all the human relation about uh, Facebook user. So, I mean, we had no way to uh, hide our identity from AI. In uh, 2015, <coughs> Chatbot uh, convinced like 33% of just that it is actually a human. Mm -hmm. So by doing that, it passed a restricted version of the Turing test. In uh, 2016, we know like Google AlphaGo defeated world champion. So yeah, we, we got like many successes with AI but uh, we also got a lot of failures. So for example, you know that your spam email filter, sometimes that the wrong email, right? And uh, you know, like self-driving car from Tesla or from uh, Waymo, caused like deadly, many deadly accidents. And also chatbot from Microsoft, they chatbot caused like embarrassment and it turns racist by engaging with hate speech, right? And we have, I mean, a lot of AI fellows. You can just go to Google and search, or you can just read the news, you see. Um, yeah, a lot of people report AI fellows. So I think it's important to um, understand um, how we use AI and how we apply AI to uh, build our software and services to make sure that um, we need uh, to take care of all the uh, scenarios before we release our AI system or AI services to the mass. Nicholas, you had brought up uh, research and ethics. And uh, in 2016, when IEEE released the, uh, the global ethics uh, platform to start monitoring how we put uh, researchers and ethicists and people all in the same room to help decide um, how we're going to approach some of these challenges. Um, what have you experienced in some of the research that you've done, and what do you feel has been um, the greatest aha or something that they've taken away or learned from putting platforms like this or panels like this together? Uh, I'm not sure I can speak specifically to that panel. Okay. Um, but so, so for example, one of the recent things that people have been looking at in machine learning is so okay, let's let's train a classifier on a whole bunch of different objects. We're going to train it on tables and chairs and suits and t types of clothing and military uniforms. And then none of these things have anything to do with gender or race. And now let's show it an image of a woman and ask, what do you see? It has no label for woman, so it can't output the label woman. So what is it going to output? If I show it just a woman's face, it's going to output miniskirt. And it's going to output bikini and things that are associated with women that it's learned to pick up on from the training data despite the fact that there is absolutely nothing to do with women in the training data. If you show an image of a white man, it will put out things like military uniform or plunger. If you put in an image of a black man, it likes to say basketball because many of the people, only like 10% of the, peop image, the people in the training data were people of color, but almost all of the people who were black were basketball players in this training data set. So it learned that anything to do with a black man is basketball. If you should put it in an image of an Asian man, it often would say ping pong, because that was one of the, uh, the valid outputs. 
And so you see these inputs, these examples where these data sets have no notion of, of people of color, no notion of gender, but despite that, they're picking up on very specific things that we probably wouldn't want them to. Uh, and it's very concerning that, that they're doing these things that even in settings where you would think, I mean, classifying water bottles from tables is not something that you could think has gender implications, but it turns out that they're still learning the biases that we probably are, have revealed to them. So what we're seeing is an issue in sample, sample size because when you're limiting your sample size, um, then obviously we're not recognizing the diversity of people. And um, so I don't know if, you know, I wanna see how that ties into what you're saying even about shutting down ads. I don't like ads, but I know that you're, you're gaining information about your audience and sample size matters or else we continue to hit these walls. Yeah, so that, that's um, very interesting. And I actually wanna speak to that from the Sinchapi standpoint because uh, the big, sort of value prop of Sinchapi is that uh, we don't believe in machine intelligence replacing human intelligence. We believe that the future is one of a collaboration between machines and humans. And I do want to step back a little bit and just level set with everyone on what machine learning and AI really is, right? Because a lot of people who aren't in the field think it's magic, because it appears to be magic. But uh, really, really, these are, these are scientific, mathematical, engineering processes, right? They're patterns. It looks like magic because we have huge uh, data sets that we train classifiers on and, and that, um, that leads to a, a variety of outcomes that may seem like they fit, uh, that they're appropriate out, out, um, outputs from the function or uh, may not seem to be appropriate as was just described. But really this is, it's all, it's engineering, it's computer science, right? Um, and the reason that machine intelligence can't replace human intelligence is because what machines have is the ability to scale to do things at scale and to, to very rarely fail at scale. What humans have that machines don't have and we haven't been able to really replicate in machines is empathy, adaptability, and the ability to quickly pick up on information without being explicitly programmed to do so. So in the example of training tables, uh, clothing items, water bottles, and things like that, a machine looks at that and says, okay, I see a picture of a woman, this is a bikini, Humans can, can talk to each other and figure out that exception, get that new information, and integrate it very quickly. For machines, it's much harder to do that because the way we program machines, there's a lot of friction there. And so in the work that I do, it's all about we want to have this collaboration between human and machine intelligence. And the reason is because bias is as much a technical problem as it is a cultural problem. Um, and, and as we've seen, bias can be both intentional and unintentional. So you have intentional bias oftentimes when you explicitly load up your training data with non-diverse data sets, right, with, with non-diverse information. But there's unintentional bias when you have data sets and you're, you know, you're trying to classify things that you think are pretty innocuous, but because machines at scale are very good at picking up repeatable patterns and then trying to make inferences based on those patterns in incorrect ways, in ways that humans can do very naturally, you end up with bad outcomes. Um, so in, in the work that I do, I'm very cognizant of the bias problem and trying to combat it, combat both that intentional bias and that unintentional bias by having more diverse inputs, but also having more diverse groups at the table so that early on in the process, we can try to rectify these things or course correct if necessary. So Jeff, I'm going to ask you to just take that one step further and then talk about the security piece of what you're seeing um, with the work that you're doing and any of the considerations that you're doing specifically with your company or that you're seeing in the audience or in the industry, and then we'll come down this way. Absolutely. So um, I've worked my entire career in data security, and, and security with respect to data uh, which, which is ultimately when you're dealing with machine learning and AI, it's, it's all about the data. Uh, data security is a very complex topic and it's a major issue. Um, you have, you're, you're dealing with everything from uh, trying to secure data uh, at rest, secure data in motion, ensuring that data isn't breached in any sort of way. There are all sorts of topics, which I'm not gonna get into, encryption and all that boring stuff uh, that you have to deal with. But there's also uh, what I think of security is, is from the civil libertarian standpoint of the, the source of the data, whether it's a person or it's you know, a company, 
whoever's giving you this data or wherever you're, or, or where, wherever you're getting this data from, the security of that um, entity and, and their ability to have privacy and ownership of the data, right? And this has become a, a larger conversation that uh, the industry is rightfully having. And so in the work that I do, and I hinted on this in my introduction, specifically when you're dealing with end users and collecting data from them, um, it's very important to be able to do that in a way where you, you, it's sort of informed consent. The users understand that they are giving you data. Uh, they understand why they're giving you data. They understand how you're going to use it and that they can trust you with the data. Um, and that's the major challenge for any company is that to be, is, is to be a good steward of the data and to respect their privacy um, in that sense. Um, and I deal a lot in particular with just securing data that's being stored at scale. When you've got large data sets that are housed in a bunch of different places, the challenge is how do you continually secure this data? Um, how do you ensure that it can't be breached? And if it is breached, that it ha you can mitigate uh, the ramifications of that as quickly as possible and, and uh, curtail the extent to which is going to be catastrophic. Um, and it's, it's a challenge. And I don't think that the industry has found a silver bullet. There are a variety of techniques. Uh, but it's something that we have to continue to keep working at. Nan, can you talk about, um, we talked about what makes AI safe in our, on our call, but, and I want you to talk about that. But can you first express a little bit about what makes it not safe? What are some of the things that you know about it that aren't safe? And then how do, what do we need to do to make sure that it is safe? Oh, OK, yeah. Um, so the problem of AI safety is the problem of keeping humans safe, right? So we we know that uh, like many like algorithm, let's say um, object recognition uh, system, fail to detect like human uh, uh, black skin, mm -hmm. and also uh, it also I mean many commercial system still fail to detect the gender of human um, with black skin. Uh, so. I, I think we we need to like understand why AI fails, right? So it's because uh, so going back to the image search problem. So we we use like specific training data. So for image uh, detection, object detection uh, problem, we use mostly image net data. We train our deep neural network on image net, and so most of the images images in image net. Uh, are built by several nations like America, uh, UK, and I mean China, Russia contributes only like about three percent of ImageNet. So we have like skew in the data, right? So so that's why um, yeah our when we build our like object detection system, it fails to to like recognize like different people of different colors. So um, I think we need to um, bring all the policy makers and uh, researchers together to brainstorm and to define the mechanism, the framework, um, the set of rules and regulations to um, help like, developers, software engineers, to build like, a safe AI. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and we, um, we need to make sure that our own engineers and researchers understand the, their responsibility and understand the dual use of their AI uh, software and services. So they, they might have good intent when they build their software, but other bad people might use their software for like bad purpose right, to satisfy their ill will. And the third thing I think we, we need to have a standard best practices and guidelines to help uh, people to do the right thing in AI development. Yeah, and, and if I may add um, that question about when can AI be unsafe, one of the thought experiments uh, that I've heard several times over the last uh, year or so is this idea of a government run by AI, right? And, and you know, you can imagine it might be a little more efficient, uh, but if all the examples we have of where machines make mistakes for whatever reasons, because of biased input, or, or other reasons, uh, the, the thing about humans is that humans have the ability to have an opinion, and those opinions may, may be bad opinions, uh, but 
different people with different opinions can come together and, and come to um, outcomes that machines that are biased towards can, having consensus of correctness, right? If their notion of correctness is flawed, then you do that at scale, that could be catastrophic. So uh, I think that's another example of where um, AI failing uh, could be, be really, really harmful um, and something to think about. Uh, to add on to this sort of notion of safety, one more point. Um, I think sort of everyone probably has heard this issue of the Uber self-driving uh, self car that ran into a person. Uh, so I don't know if you guys saw the NTSB report on that. So what ended up happening was the, there was a vision algorithm in there which tries to detect, is there an object in the way? And initially the, the question was, maybe it didn't recognize there was a person. And maybe it didn't recognize and that's why it kept going. Uh, it turns out it did recognize there was a person there. The, the AI b system behaved correctly and saw there was a person, but the company had disabled the ability for the AI to turn on the brakes. And because of that, it knew a person was there, but couldn't do anything about it. And I think that sort of, even if you get the AI right, you have to actually use the knowledge correctly. The reason why they had turned off the brakes in this case is because it had a large number of false positives. Uh, fairly often it would detect things that weren't there, and so it was trying to turn on the brakes when, the, when it shouldn't have, and so they had sort of just turned off that system and decided let's not do that because we don't want to break all the time. Turns out the result of that is someone dies. So you need to make sure that when you're using these systems, that even if the systems are behaving correctly, you have to take the whole system into account and actually do everything all together correctly. I'm going to get to um, questions as soon as I ask um, one more. The, um, one of the experiences that I want to share is around Black Lives Matter and the importance of code and where technology can play into some of this. And we hosted um, a hackathon with some students at HBCUs to really try to understand what some of these challenges could be. And in working with um, a business in Compton uh, called Shot Caller. Um, there's a great technology that detects and identifies shots fired versus loud noises, specifically in diverse communities, so that police can be uh, fair warned and not come into an environment shooting to kill when maybe it's firecrackers or just a loud boom. Um, so it's another example of um, the brakes not being allowed to deploy in the end user um, having a negative, obviously, you know, death. But it goes also back to why I stand so firmly on this commitment to diversity and having a different thread of thought. We talked about machine learning and human, just the human um, empathy that's critical here. And if you continue to not have um, a diverse platform sitting on the keyboards or sitting in uh, the design rooms, then we will continually continue to not think about the challenges that face the broader community, not just the black community, but all of our communities that we want to be the recipients of a safe and a robust AI platform. So I'm gonna take a couple of questions and then I'm gonna let um, all the members of the panel do a wrap up. You had your hand. Um, I don't know if there's anyone with the mic, so why don't you just speak up and the young lady here, there's a gentleman in the red, and then we'll, we'll kind of go around, but go ahead. So we're going to let you have one, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, that's a good Please question. Take it away. Yeah. Um, so my initial thought there is 
I, we have to tackle the way we talk about diversity and inclusion holistically, not even just for AI, uh, but from a from you know an end-to-end -end societal standpoint. And what I think I think where a lot of people err um, is that they think you've solved the diversity and inclusion problem when you don't talk about it and you don't see it. So it's that we don't see race, we don't see gender, we've solved the problem. And what ends up happening is that when you don't talk about these things, people by default, it's human nature, they gravitate towards things that are familiar. And things that are familiar are things that look like you, that talk like you, that have your background, that have your interests, right? And so what ends up happening is when people hire, they say, oh, we're committed to diversity and inclusion. And you know, we, we, don't, look, we don't look at race. We don't check people's LinkedIn's because we don't want to see the picture, right? We just get the resume and we hire the best people. Well, what ends up happening is that your definition of best is biased towards who you are, right? Instead, what we have to do is we have to keep race and we have to keep gender, we have to keep all the other identities that people carry with them at the forefront because we have to be intentional about saying we need more of this at the table. We need more women on this panel. We've got to be very intentional about that. And, we, and, and, and it's not to call anyone out necessarily or publicly shame anyone, but it's to say that the challenge, if you want to uh, truly have, if you truly want to minimize the bias in AI and the negative outcomes that it, that it produces is that you've always got to look at who has a seat at the table, who's there and who's not there. And if you've got to expand the table and get more chairs, then that's what you've got to do, right? And that's, and that's how we have to tackle it. So if you go somewhere and people aren't talking about diversity and inclusion, and they're saying that their solution to that is, well, you know, we, those things don't matter to us, right? That's actually the wrong answer, it should matter. It should matter so much that you're constantly thinking about how do we get more representation at this table uh, to, to prevent some of those uh, catastrophic um, outcomes from happening. Before I go to the next question, I'd also just want to say from a tactical perspective, um, when I speak with companies now in their, their HR departments, some of this is very tactical. Where are you recruiting? What are, where is your talent acquisition team spending their time? Are you going to the same schools that you used to go to? When's the last time you did a refresh of your, your, your target schools and where you're putting your money? What conferences are you supporting? Um, you know, the traditional tech conferences versus where some of this new talent is being grown. How are you writing your job descriptions? Because you're not attracting talent because simply your job descriptions aren't speaking um, to the type of work that they think they might be drawn to. And it sounds like a simple shift, but it actually is not to take a coding role and then figure out how to write it so that it's poetic or that it speaks to various genders or people that were raised in different communities. And so these are just some of the work streams and things that we looked at and we tackled and from a very tactical perspective, how we show up, who we send to the different campuses, how we fill the pipeline, how we recruit, retain, what types of work um, are the diverse technologists on our team doing? Um, when they leave those roles, where were they going? They're leading in, leaving the engineering fields and going um, to quality. So they're staying in, techno in the engineering space, but they're leaving um, kind of a, a keyboarded programming space and why. So you've got to, from a business perspective, get very tactical and try to figure out what your data analytics is saying about how you run your company. I'm going to let in the red shirt here. Uh, thank you. Very much. Thank you. Um, so, Excelsi, we know that a number of <coughs> so the keynote that a number of the Alexa devices is growing so rapidly, which is great for Amazon, but also at the same time, it's just scary because uh, in my home alone, the number of Alexa devices doubles a number of my household hmm. members. <laughs> so, I was wondering in your security expertise and skills, are there enough? I mean, we can always use more security. Uh, I'm, I'm never going to say there's enough of that. I'm, I personally am not concerned right now that Alexa or these things are going to be 
like actively trying to be malicious. Um, I think if they wanted to be, there are significantly worse things they could do that they are not doing. And so like we tend to trust them with that. I'm much more concerned with the case where the developer is trying to be good and accidentally does something wrong. So for example, we had this case recently where someone was talking and their entire conversation was recorded and forwarded to one of their friends. Um, so why did this happen? Well, it turns out when you have people, when you have a million of these devices and people are talking a lot every once in a while, something, some, someone says something that sounds like, please send this message to my friend. And then the device will ask, are you sure you want to do this? And then the person says something that sounds like, yes. And so the device it, it did the right thing. Someone said, please send this message to a friend. It asked, are you sure you want to do this? And then the response was yes. And so it sent the message to a friend of, of, of recording. Now, this was not, it was not the developer's intent to do this, but it happened. And so I think that's sort of the more concerning thing to me is not Amazon is evil and is going to record all of our conversations. Um, but more of, we are now putting these things in places where if they have unintended consequences, those consequences are more severe. Okay, I'm here and then here, so one, two. A little louder. Uh, uh, if, if people are speaking to devices and digitizing their voice, do they know it? And obviously, that, that in theory is a personal identifying piece of information. But where, does, where do you guys see that going? Because it still feels like a very gray area. Uh, so, I absolutely think that it that digitized voice, that whether it's transcribed or whether it's just an audio file, that is a piece of data, right? And in, in the spirit of GDPR, if, and I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't speak to the, to the actual regulation and the legal requirements, but I think at least the spirit of what I understand it, uh, that should certainly be covered under, under that case. And um, when you look at the, the, big, uh, the big players, the Facebooks of the world, the Amazons, the Googles, I know that certain parts of their business are GDPR compliant. Um, I don't know for like Google Home or Alexa um, what their level of GDP GDPR compliance is. Uh, but, but in general, uh, this, there, there aren't going to be fewer regulations that, um, that are going to exist with respect to, to data and legal regulatory requirements surrounding that. And what we have to condition ourselves around as people, but also as uh, companies and, and builders of things is that um, everything we do generates data, right? I mean, everything, if it just all of us right now, we're gen not only are we receiving data on, on all of our devices and we're sending data, uh, but this is being recorded, we're speaking, we're moving, everything's tracking us. Data is, is being recorded everywhere. And in a similar way to when there were laws just about, um, you know, physically recording someone or, or uh, using a, a tape recorder and recording their voice. There are certain exceptions to that law where if, you know, if I take a picture of a room um, and I'm not focused on anyone in particular, I don't necessarily have to get uh, everyone's consent to, to publish that picture, right? But then there are cases where I clearly do have to get that consent. And so uh, there is a balance that we're gonna have to uh, meet. And, and, you know, if you've got uh, certainly someone buys an Alexa device and they put it in their home and they're speaking to it, uh, they're clearly getting that data, you know, Amazon is getting that data. Um, I certainly think that's on the other side of, yes, this clearly should fall under GDPR, or at least the spirit of it. But if you've got an Amazon Alexa at a demo booth and people are walking by and they say things, you know, what is the responsibility there? Uh, it's tough, right? And these are, these are hard things we're gonna have to tackle. I have one here and then red shirt. We're gonna It's really hard. 
Um, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, if it was easy, we would be doing it. Um, I think the most important thing is to remember that it's a problem and keep that in the back of your mind as you're doing this work because there's sort of no one piece of advice that I can give that's applicable to all of the areas, but you need to remember that any one piece of your system might fail. And when that piece fails, you need to not assume that, all the other pieces need, need to not assume that that one piece is always going to succeed. Or if they do, you should have very, very good evidence that that piece is going to behave correctly. Um, so, I mean, yeah, sorry, I don't really have the perfect answer for you, but like, I, I do think that it's, being aware of it, I think, is sort of the most important piece. And as long as you're aware that like, these systems will go wrong, then ideally when something does, you will be able to correct for it before things go really, really bad. Um, and so, for example, I don't know, in the Uber case, at a certain point, when the, when, the, when the system was completely convinced it was going to hit a person, like that is the time to turn on the brakes, even if you know, maybe the thing is going to turn on the brakes a little bit when it's in traffic or when, it's not, when it shouldn't have. Um, same thing in the uh, Amazon case. If I'm going to be sending people my recordings, maybe you want to be a little more sure than normal. Like the, the, the standard it, like, the thing is um, set, set, like, set an alarm for tomorrow. OK, set an alarm for tomorrow. And then it tells me I did the thing. Um, I probably want a little bit more than that when it send me someone's send me my, my voice to someone else. If it, maybe the thing is send someone money, maybe I want even more. Maybe I want them to send me an email to make sure that, I'm, that I want to approve this. Um, so like, I mean, you can build on additional layers of security to make sure that things are going correctly. But I mean, you're asking the right question. Oh, very interesting. Okay, I have red shirt, and then you have had your hand up for a while, so I'm going to go. And to you, sorry, but I missed you there. Sorry about that. Yeah. So for the purpose of this talk, security and machine learning, I never really thought of security from a machine learning standpoint, usually from a data standpoint, some form of encryption. So just to use Nicholas's advice work in terms of um, finding the security breach and, and who fits. Um, and this is for everybody. How much is the security issue on the data side and how much is it on the machine learning side? Because from my understanding, from a speech perspective, there really is no security metrics. I mean, you take some data, you process it, you push it through, you know, the, the cycle. But I know in other domains, you actually encrypt the data and then you send it to a machine learning algorithm. So is it a matter of bridging the gap between the data and machine learning, or is it more of an encryption problem, or have we not thought about security and machine learning? I, um, I'm interested in, in where the development and research uh, yeah, yeah, that's the great question. Uh, so, um, you know, <coughs> our policy maker are uh, uh, slow and cannot keep up to um, our technological <laughs> advance, right? <laughs> so we don't have, uh, I, I mean, uh, enough like um, regulation and laws to like, regulate uh, the development of AI. Um, and you talk about uh, the security between the the data and then the machine learning. You mean the algorithm, right? Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, those are the big two uh, security uh, problems now. So I, I think both of them contribute uh, equally to the same problem. So if we don't have good data, we don't have like, um, enough training data to cover everything, then uh, we cannot have a good AI system for machine learning algorithm. If our algorithm uh, fails to uh, detect something, for example, but we, I mean, the developers, the engineers uh, are not aware of that. They build something that, um, I mean, not like as good as um, the, I mean, what they want. And I mean, they, I mean, no one knows, right? No one knows, so um, I think it's, um, I think we, we need to have like a department in every company uh, to review all the um, algorithms, all the code, and also the data uh, before we um, you know, um, <coughs> sell our products. And my last question, and then we'll, we'll try and stick around a few minutes, but I have to do this last one and keep us true to time. Security 
pressure behind someone physically speaking into the phone or receiving information um, through audio coming out of the phone? And what part are they receiving through the screen or email as, employed, uh, as opposed to hearing it through audio? What's your thought on that? And that's very measure. Uh, I'm not sure I quite understand the complete question. So when you talking into a phone, having other people hear your conversation, either what you're inputting or you're receiving through, what's your thought behind security on that? So, so, so independent of any machine learning systems, let's just the, let's talk about the security of talking about your finances over the phone. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's definitely going to be a problem insofar as any conversation is a problem if we're talking about it in a public setting. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything specific to this that um, makes it unique. Uh, when we have a conversation, if like we weren't having it here, if like I was discussing it with one of the other panelists, in this setting, anyone here could hear us, but hopefully if I went to a private place, then it wouldn't be the, the case. I'm, I'm not sure if I see anything unique about. I don't think it's a finance specific, but just kind of wondering that voice, how was some of the well, questions you're going to so, so, so I think um, in, in general, you know, for any domain, whenever you have information that's being transmitted, whether it's verbal, whether it's written, whether it's typed and it's digital, anytime information goes from one entity to another, there is a risk, right? There is a risk of eavesdropping, right? Whether if we're speaking and someone's listening in or they've got a recording device. If I'm sending you an email or I'm typing something on the screen and someone um, is eavesdropping on my connection, there's always a risk when you're, you're uh, transmitting data, right? That's why data security in motion is, is a big topic. In addition to that, um, there's a risk when information is not being transmitted. As is the, the source that contains, the entity that contains that information, can they be breached? Right? Can you sort of penetrate my brain and get into my thoughts? Um, and if I know a secret, can you, can you sort of do some inception magic on me and get it that way? All right? Or if it's on a server and it's not being transmitted, can you hack it that way? And the reason why security is such an interesting topic um, is because while we have tools, right? We, encryption is, is not new, right? Ultimately, every uh, data security or security protocol is going to come to some, some form of encryption, right? The idea of encrypting information is not new. The reason security is an interesting problem is because you have so many pieces. Data, information is always being transmitted. There are so many sources of information. And the challenge is how do you have a comprehensive security posture that addresses each of those individual pieces? How do you address you know, the you know, point A as, a as an individual security problem, then A to B and the transmission there is a security problem, B is a security problem, then how do you scale that up and out? Um, that, that's something that you know, I work with a lot of companies that are saying, well, all of our security problems are gonna be challenged if we keep it on premise. Or we're just gonna shoot it to you and put it in the cloud and then you're responsible for the security. You're gonna have security challenges wherever, and it's going to be a continual process of making sure that your posture is up to date, um, it's, it's aware of threats, and it, it has plans in case those threats are actualized and realized, and, and so forth. Thank you. So I want to thank you all for coming. Um, like Nicholas said in his last comment, you're asking the right questions. We're digging in the right spaces, and I just ask that all of us in our roles and our practices hold each other, our companies, our teams accountable to the work that's uh, that responsible for security. So thanks for coming. Enjoy the rest of the summit. <laughs>